Hello beautiful people, my name is Diane McKendrick and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the Rise and Shine podcast. As you heard in the introduction, we are here to help you design your best life. So just before we get started, know that I've started doing these podcasts. I have no idea how I've got all the gear. I have no idea how to use any of it, but I committed to getting at least 30 minutes of recorded content out to you guys every week until I learn how to do it. So here I am, I'm on Zoom and I've got all the bits and pieces and now you're going to get 30 minutes of absolute gold nuggets from me so we can take you from where you are right now and just launch you into your future. So this is podcast number two and today we are discussing working from home with children. So the, at the time of this recording, the coronavirus has hit the world. The world is in a state of crisis in our health and in our finances. And what's happened to a lot of working mums because businesses have been closed down is that we are working from home. And we're navigating so many different things, the change in the financial environment, the change in people's relationships, because a lot of husbands or wives or partners are home now and we're not used to that. And the big one, working from home when you have little people around. And I had so many of you come to me and ask me because you see my Instagram stories and I'm so committed and connected and I spend a lot of time with my kids and you can see my content flowing now. You can see so much content being produced over the last couple of weeks because I am on purpose. This is my sole purpose. This is my desire. Every morning when I wake up, whether it's a good or a bad day, because we have both, my feet hit the ground and I am ready to rock and roll. So I had to find a way. As a lot of you know, my husband is fly in, fly out. So he is home now because he has lost his income, his flying income for an undisclosed period of time, which left our family in a lot of distress and a lot of uncertainty, like many of you out there. So it's like, okay, Daisy, you need to get into the office and you need to package your products that can actually help people through these times and you need to do it and you need to provide. So here we are, We're going, we've gone through the uncertainty, we've been a little bit unsure, we've practiced what we preached on in uh, just recently this week, we have done the fear neutralization process, the guilt neutralizer, the loss neutralizer, all of it. So we actually use this and it's changed our life. Um, so what I wanna address with you now is the top 10 tips, 10 tips guys, we're gonna break it down. I'm gonna give you really easy to digest top 10 tips, which is gonna change your absolute experience of working from home with your children around you. And it was the perfect morning to do it because Esme was really clingy this morning and we were uncertain and unsure. I'm recording today for my mastermind, which means it needs to be quiet. I need to be on my own. I need to be able to focus. And as you all know, that doesn't happen when you've got a clingy five-year-old hanging off your leg. And, you know, I could have done it with her there, but then you're not getting the best of me. You're only getting a part of me. So I thought to myself, how can I change this? And I always ask the question, how can I help more people? So that's what I decided to do this podcast about today was, how can we work from home, keep producing the most amazing work ever while having our needs met and also getting the needs of our children met? I have two little ones. Ross is eight years old and Esme is five. My husband is home at the moment, which I'm very grateful for. And I can actually see Ross and I just give them the sign. If I'm recording, it's just like one of these ones and he's turned around and he's walked back down to the shed. He'll be up in another 20 minutes or so. So we need to put these little things into place so we can support our children through these times as well. If you're feeling really anxious and really scattery and unsure and uncertain, that's okay, but the kids are going to pick up on that. So what we wanna do for Gus and I particularly is come to the relationship and the connection with our kids as a united front. So if we're feeling separated because he's going through his fear and I'm going through my fear, then the kids are gonna feel that. So really start to look at your relationship, one, with yourself, and secondly, with your partner. So when you come to the connection and the relationship with your kids, you can actually, um, what is it? You can demonstrate and give the example of how you want your relationship to be with the kids. Okay. So who's ready? Who's ready to get into the top 10 tips? So the first tip to working at home productively 
and getting that content out there while you have got kids at home is you have to set your state. Step number one, set your state. And you have to release the control and release the attachment to the outcome. So an example of that for me was this morning, I wanted to go for a walk. I do my long, slow cardio every single morning. And the outcome for me is to walk a certain distance in a certain amount of time at a certain speed, because I know scientifically that's doing what I need for my body. And it's all about the fat loss and the um, the hormone production and all that sort of thing. So I had in my head, I'm going for a walk. It's going to be this long. It's going to be this fast. Next minute, a little voice behind me is like, oh, I want to come because quite often the kids come on my morning walk with me. So I was like, okay, I had to pivot and I had to change straight away. I knew firstly, the walk was going to be a lot slower. I knew secondly, I wanted to do my blogging and let you all know on Instagram about what I'm doing today. So I was going to have my little girl there with me, which meant that I was, going, was not going to get the speed, the peace and quiet and all the things that I expected from my walk. Okay. So as she started to come, I set my state. Okay, I either say, yes, you can come and I be present with her and I support her through that journey with me on the walk or I say, no, you can't come. You've got to stay home and put up with the tantrum around it. But whatever decision you make, you've got to be present with it. So I said, yep, okay, that's cool, come. I had to go within and it had to be quick. Like I could feel it. For me, it's just like this feeling of coming up of frustration and, oh my gosh, this is so hard. So I had to flick my mindset. And as we started to walk, I set my intention for the walk, which was to support her, connect with her, have her be part of what I was doing. So as we walked, if you go over to my Instagram stories, I'll save them on the highlights so you can have a look. Um, yeah, we did some talking. She was really cranky. She was really clingy. She was pulling me on all the to pulling on me the whole time. But if I hadn't have changed my mindset and re released control of the outcome, we would have fought the whole way. So you've got to make that decision. Yes, you can come, but you've got to choose to be present with them and set the, uh, the, the boundaries and the foundations so they know what's going on. But most importantly, I had to change what was happening in my head. So I wasn't going to go as far. I wasn't going to walk as fast, but it was an opportunity to connect, move and get out. So I changed my expectation and I changed the goalpost. So then I could get my walk in and I could also spend time with her because I knew deep in my heart, if I spent this time with her in the morning, what was going to happen is it was going to give me more freedom through the day. And I needed it because I'm recording today, right? So because I chose to do that this morning, they are not now down there in the shed with Gus feeling really filled up and really happy with the situation. They don't even realize it. You've got to step back and you've got to manage it. You stop reacting to stuff and step back and sort of watch what's happening. And without them realizing it, you're guiding the situation. So step one, setting your state, releasing control, dropping the attachment to the outcome, getting creative. I still got to go on my walk. I got to spend time with her. It wasn't as fast or as long, but in the big picture, does that really matter? That tip alone will change life. So make sure you write it down. Release control, uh, set your state, release control and release attachment to the outcome. We're gonna get creative and we're gonna see how creative and productive we can be around these decisions. Okay, step number two. Step number two is to include them. If you go over and watch the Instagram stories, you'll see once I did my walk, I come back and I do a workout because this is a part of me setting state for the day. So I can be here and present and excited to work with you. I feel better when I work out. So in one part of my brain, it was like, oh, great. Esme's here, I'm not gonna be able to, once again, work out the way I like to work out as long or as hard as I would usually do. So she was clingy, she was on top of me. I had to use the first step in telling you about what the second step is. I had to include her. Because once again, I knew that if I included her, it takes a little bit longer. That equals freedom for the rest of the day. If you give them that framework and that foundation when they think they need it, it sets you up for a better day. I have also done this. I just want to get it done and I keep pushing away and I keep pushing away and I keep just distracting and telling her to go do something. I get frustrated. She's on edge and she just is even more clingy. I still catch myself in that pattern sometimes. But if you genuinely include them, then what's going to happen is they feel valued and they feel excited and they get part of you. So I'm getting what I want. I'm getting my workout in. I'm getting to spend time with my little girl. 
Ross at this stage is just happy playing with a plane. Him and Gus are building a plane. So I just had her to deal with. Sometimes it's both of them. Literally sometimes I'm doing squats with one on this arm and one on this arm. And then sometimes I'm like, this is too hard. I'm just not working out. They're a little older now, so it's a lot of fun and I can usually manage it. But I remember when they were little, I would get myself to the gym, which was like a half day ordeal. And then I'd just be like, oh my gosh, this is too hard. I'm literally just going to take them for a walk right now. So Let's include them. Go over to the Instagram stories. It's really cute. I'm doing push-ups. It took longer. I got her to help me write stuff up on the board. It was really beautiful. And literally, it took me probably 45 minutes instead of 30, but it felt really good. And to watch her shift and change and feel supported, guys, is really priceless. So include them what you're doing. Um, the other thing that I did when I included her in what I was doing, so this is tip number three in the way that we communicate with them because I found myself before I sort of knew this and I recognised this, what I was doing was saying, um, so she was writing up on the board, I've got a board over there where we write up my program, 20 push-ups and she's like, mum, how do you spell push-ups? So here I am adding in, including her, a little bit of homeschooling, writing, holding her pencil, um, counting backwards, forwards. If I've done 10 and we've got 10 more to go, so we're including, we're homeschooling, we're habit stacking, that's a huge thing of mine. She's writing up on the board 20 push-ups and she's holding her pen go over to instagram you'll see she's holding her pen like all like weird and used to me i would used to go esme that's not how you hold your pen hold it like this and have any of you noticed when you talk to your kids in direct demands it's like if i said to you you shouldn't do it like that do it like this how do you feel like straight away you get this feeling inside and you're like hold on a second are you telling me what to do i don't like that and i know that because i don't like being told what to do and gus is a pilot an international airline pilot and they have whole training series on how to talk to people just these little tips that you can do to sort of help yourself have a more aware conversation with someone. So here Esme is writing 20 push-ups, learning how to spell, doing her thing on the board, and she's holding her pen like all crazy. And I just said to her, is that how you hold your pen? And you could see her thinking and being a bit cheeky and then doing it on purpose to kind of annoy me. But I know it would be so different if I was like, don't hold your pen like this, hold it like that. She would have just butted heads with me and been like, you, I'll do it the way that I want it. And I said, is that how you hold your pen? And, she, and then I could see her think about it. And then I said, is that how the teacher shows you to hold your pen? And she changed it. And then I heard her talking to Ross about it later. This is how we hold pen. So instead of talking to them in direct demands, which sometimes we have to do, but we've got to pick our times, right? Um, speak to them in questions because it empowers them to make the decision even though that you've subconsciously given them the answer to their question that you're asking so the answer is given through the questioning we can do that with ourselves too that's another podcast i'll tell you about that later so she changed the way she held her pencil she had a lesson um she got to do the push-ups with me she giggled her head off she had so much fun and then uh and then what happened this is step number four and you guys are all gonna love this because i've talked to i work with a lot of mums and this happens in every single household the I'm hungry. Okay, so we've finished breakfast. It's 8.30 in the morning. We've finished breakfast. By 8.45, both kids are on my side beside me as I'm trying to get ready and do my thing. Mom, I'm hungry. Mom, I'm hungry. It used to drive me bonkers. And because I was always in a rush and I was doing so much, what I would do is like grab an apple or do this or do that. Or let, let me just quick make you a Vegemite rice cracker. But what I found was I was re reacting to their demands all day and I wasn't getting anything done except running around like a chookless head, picking up after them, getting them what they wanted slash needed. No, they didn't need it. Getting them what they wanted in that moment. And I was just like a puppet being, I didn't do it on purpose, but mom, I'm hungry. So there's another feeling attached. So what happened there was the I'm hungry. Step number four is set a framework, set a framework for the day. We just implemented this week because I was noticing this pattern of the I'm hungry. And so there's two things we say now, if you're hungry right now, you didn't eat enough breakfast or did you eat enough breakfast? Because then it empowers them the next day, they're, if they're going to eat more breakfast, if they're, if they're genuinely hungry, step number one, you either eat more at the meal before to fill you up 
And then step number two is to set the framework so they can come and they know that at 10.30 every morning between 10.30 and 11, we stop and we have something to eat. So at 8.45, the I'm hungry starts and I give two answers. One, did you eat enough for breakfast? Probably not because you're hungry now, so eat more tomorrow. Uh, or morning tea at 10.30, come and join us. Dad and I are gonna sit down, you can have your apple then. And guess what, they learn. So the first couple of days we did it, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, but I'm really hungry, I'm starving. And they'd go into this big dramatic mode. I said, that's fine, eat more breakfast. We're eating morning tea at 10.30. And honestly, it's been one of the things that's gifted me so much freedom because I'm not having to run, race around and make food and then pack up after food and make food and pack up after food and make food and pack up after food 15,000 freaking times a day. So we have breakfast together. If you haven't eaten your breakfast in the time allocated for breakfast, too bad, so sad. I'm not, and I need to be a bit stricter sometimes on this as well. If you don't eat it and it's packed up and it's cleaned up, then you wait till the next meal. So what that does is it creates it, it creates a certainty within the environment, environment where they know that there's food coming so they don't get obsessed on it. So that's been really helpful. So setting up that framework, that's step number four. Okay, step number five, this is prime. This is paramount because this happens in every single household and I had to touch wood because I think I jinxed myself. I said to my sister the other day, oh my gosh, my kids are getting along so well. We've now been isolated at home and homeschooling for nearly two weeks and Gus, my husband, was away for a lot of that. The kids have not left the house for two weeks. I've been out to the shops and that's literally it. We thought they would be going stir crazy. They have been getting along so well. It's beautiful. Touch wood. Anyway, two, two days later this morning as I'm doing this, this podcast, the blog, um, all everything hilarious they start fighting boom boom getting into it physical yelling swearing at each other and you know the old me would have just reacted to it and, and got in there and like right you get over there and tried to be like crazy where I just would have been crazy because I was just reacting and I was frustrated and I wasn't grounded so now I've set up a system it was really helpful for me to do this guys because it makes me realize how far I've come in just the last month because even just a week or two, no, probably two or three weeks ago, I would have just got frustrated. I get this feeling and it's hot and it's fiery and I just want to explode. But there's no use doing that because the kids don't get it. They just, I have done it a handful of times in the um, period of having the kids and I change my voice and I'm asking my voice must change because I'm at my threshold and I explode. I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I never yell and I don't explode because I do, but now it's less. I don't ever get to that threshold because I've put these things in place. So what I do now is we have a keyword. So I sat both the kids down um, in a time, you got to look at the timing for it because when I wanted to do it, they were both just like zinging off the corners and off the, off the walls. And I was like, now's not the time. I have to adapt and I have to, you know, watch and observe and pick the right time. So I sat there with them one day and I said, you know how you two sometimes get annoyed with each other? Notice the questioning. And they're both like, yeah, he does that and calls me a dickhead. And oh, yeah, she does that and calls me this and whatever. And I was like, okay, feel that feeling. When you're feeling like this, Ross, and you're frustrated and you can feel it, you know, rising and you're angry at her or Esme, when you're feeling like that with Ross, we are going to have a key word. If you get to your threshold and you're feeling it, what's the key word that you can say to let that other person know? I had the one that I wanted to direct. I said, I want you to say this, but it doesn't work like that because they need to be involved. And then they, they take uh, ownership over the decision. I said, so what's a word that we could use to let that other person know that we're pissed off right now and we're feeling frustrated and we're feeling angry and we just want you to leave us the freaking hell alone, okay? And both of them said, I said, well, what do you need? Well, I need time. I need time away from that person or that person. I said, okay, cool. How, how about the word, word time? So they, they gave me the word time. So now when they start to fight, I don't have to get involved because what was happening is I was walking in like this. I was wanting to grab one hair, one kid by the hair and the other kid by the hair and throw one that way and throw that one. Like, I'm just being honest here. Let me know if I'm out here on my own, but I just would be so angry and so frustrated. And I tend to be a pretty calm person. But if anything, that can press those buttons, it's your freaking kids, like drive your nuts, right? That's why this information is so important. So we sat down when the time was right and it's all harmonious and everyone's listened to each other. 
And instead of walking there, grabbing this kid by the hair and this kid by the hair and throwing them each way, which is exactly what I wanted to do in all honesty, uh, was like, okay, someone's pissing someone off and I hear them yell out, time. I get this, this like rising, I mean, I just want to walk in and do the thing. I'm like, right, get here and get here. I've got stuff to do and I'm trying to concentrate and you little shits are carrying on and fighting. You should be grateful. Listen to the language. It's not resourced. You should be grateful. And some kids don't have this. And, you know, I'm so, such a tentative mum and I just, this is all the stuff I just want to throw at them, but I don't. I just stay out here and I take a couple of deep breaths. And guess what happened this morning? I hear Esme call out, time. And Ross says, okay. And Esme walks to her bedroom. And that's the key that when she, when that person yells out time and walks to the bedroom, the boundary is the bedroom door. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes the offender, the annoyer, will stand at the bedroom door, like right on the boundary and stick their head and still be like, bleh, 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 bleh. you're an idiot, you're a dickhead, whatever it is. But most of the time we've trained them now that when they say time, they got to go to their bedroom and that other person is not allowed in. That's the boundary. And then Ross did it. It happened last night. Esme was poking the tiger. Everybody was tired. And Ross just yells out, time, stamps his foot, walks off to his room. Esme follows him, keep poking the tiger. But once he was in his room and he said that keyword, she had to leave him alone. It's absolutely amazing. And then guess what? It's incredible. Ross is, yeah, he's giving me the wave. Um, it's absolutely incredible because after I've taught them to do that, I do it. When I feel this, as a mother, you don't have to be there all of the time and you don't have to pretend you're okay all of the time. So there's sometimes I feel it rising up inside of me and I'm like, time! And I go to my bedroom for five minutes and they leave me alone and I come back and I'm a lot, trust me, a lot more nicer than I would be otherwise. So that's really good. That's step number five. Create a keyword and some boundaries around the fighting. It does take a little time to train them. And honestly, it doesn't work every time, but it works more often than not. And now my kids are at that age and we've been training them for a little while. The times it does work, even if it doesn't work more often than not, if it's not working as often, just imagine this ladies or in men, any men watching this, if one, two, three, four, maybe five times a day out of 57 fights, they can sort themselves out and go and get some time away, which just leaves you to be doing whatever you need to do because we are all wearing so many hats. A lot of us are working from home, you're keeping house, you're cleaning up cubby houses after them, whatever. It's just like such a big sigh of relief. So try that, it's really cool. Um, the next thing, is step number six, you need, if you are working from home, you need a very dedicated spot to your work. Don't take your laptop and sit on the couch or sit in bed because the kids need to know boundaries. As you've been watching this podcast, what you've seen is both Ross and Esme have walked up to the window. If you've been to my house, got beautiful big windows looking down to the shed and you would have seen me go like this because this is my workspace. And a lot of the time they're allowed in here. If I'm on calls, um, there's some things they're allowed in here for. And there's other things if I'm getting interviewed or doing a podcast or doing recording for the mastermind, I just go like that. Like I'll look over and put my finger up. You wouldn't even know it, but you'll notice it now. And they know that they're not allowed to come in here because mummy's doing needs the time and mummy needs it important. I say, always at the end, I let them know when I'm finished and when they can come in here. So once again, it's setting up these really, it's designing this space for when they know it's appropriate to come in and not when it's not appropriate to come in. So if I was out on the deck or in some of their uh, play spaces, then the boundaries are crossed and they're blurry and the kids don't know. And I don't really know because this is something I have to get better as well. If I say don't come in here and they do because I'm a bit of a soft nurturing type and I can hear Gus saying, don't go in there, mum's asked you not to go in. Um, and then they come in and it's not that important or I'm on a call and it's not my turn to speak. I'll put my arm out and they'll come over and I'll give them a little cuddle. Um, I would recommend not doing that. I still do it and I still catch myself doing it, but, but that's why there's a mum and dad, right? The dad's generally a bit harder. And I'm like, oh, it's okay. But what it's doing is blurring the lines for them. 
So it's really important they don't come in when I'm podcasting or when I'm recording because I'm in flow. Uh, or if I'm in a one-on-one, someone going through something really traumatic, it's nothing more of putting them a kid running in and yelling out penis, wee wee bum, head, which is what SMA usually does. Um, so what we do is we set those clear boundaries, have your dedicated space, keep it clean, keep it tidy. Um, and here's a disclaimer. If you could see on the other side of the computer, I've cleaned it up now, but if you saw the Facebook uh, last week, they had completely like transformed my office area into a cubby house. I have a meditation triangle there that I sit in to do my meditations. <laughs> they made a cubby house out of it. They were stashing wine bottles and everything. They had little laboratories in there where they had um, the stuff that we were wake, uh, take out to the the recycling being they stashed down in between the pillows. So when I went and helped them clean it up, there's a bottle of wine, there was an empty bottle of wine, uh, a bag of lettuce, like the container that the lettuce comes in. What else was there? Esme had little containers of almonds, like they watch us and they do as we do. So you've got to keep this area clean. However, when you're working from home, releasing control, and I just thought to myself, you know what? This is in a step a little bit later, but just release control and let that be for a certain period of time and then we're all going to clean it up later when I can have my space back, when they're not interested in it anymore. Because sometimes when I do these calls, they'll just sit and lay or draw. So I've trained them just to sit and draw when I'm on some of the calls that it doesn't matter. Or if I'm just listening in and doing my training, they'll come out here and then they're feeling involved. Um, so we just went through the dedicated workspace and setting clear boundaries. Now, step number seven, step number seven is about getting them to help. I don't know if I've got it here to show you. Where is it? Yeah, it's the top one. I do my bulk mail outs on Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and I've got a lot on, guys. So I get Esme or Ross, and that's probably back the front, to do little things like this. So that says my address. Now everybody knows my address, um, if you can even read it. And part of my brain was like, oh, that's really unprofessional, it doesn't look good at all. But my mum brain, which I have to operate from, is like, how can I involve these kids? How can I take some of the pressure off myself and have them feeling ownership over this business? Ownership over, you know, creating, an, uh, creating a creative income? And how can I start to show them that they can design their life and choose it. So the other day, because we get, I get huge mail out with the ring and the charm and the pixie cards now, and of course my my book, which is going Amazon bestseller at the end of April, um, we have huge mail out. So instead of just printing out the stickers and making it easy, which sometimes I do, I give both the kids a couple of envelopes and they write the names on the back and they put the stamps on it. So if you ever get stuff from me and the stamps are crooked all over the front and the writing on the back is crazy, it's not because I'm crazy and I've written with my left hand or in a rush and writing really messy, it's because I involve my kids in it. I get them to help. So what that's doing is helping her feel um, and Ross feel included in what I'm doing. It t they both know their address off by heart now because I've written it a million times and they have an understanding of going to work, going to work and what it might mean. And there's times that uh, just yesterday, it might've been the day before Esme, it's like, oh, again, I don't wanna do it. And then that opens up the conversation of, well, discipline and this person has paid for this and needs this. And yeah, then you can have that can take take it down another rabbit warren of lessons that you can teach them. And yeah, it's really amazing and really beautiful. This is cool. I should have done this on Facebook Live. Okay, so now we're up to step number eight. Step number eight. We're going to talk about what I mentioned earlier with my office being a total disaster zone of <laughs> A disaster zone, like honestly, guys, there's crap everywhere, and the house as well, because we're used to. Most of us are used to the kids going off school, uh, off to school, and they go to school. Everything goes back into its place, or the little shoes and knickers that are hanging around, and the piles of clothes that have been dropped. Which we put some processes in place to help them teach delegate right, get the clothes in the basket, um, the shoe, the odd shoe that's out on the back deck that nobody else sees except the mum. When you're scanning the house, you're working, you're doing 15 things that thing, you're making everybody coffee you're doing your zoom calls and you're like oh there's a spare shoe out there and a piece of lego got to go get the shoe and lego and put them back in their space nobody other nobody other person sees it just me and if i don't do that now it's just going to get overwhelming and on top of me and i'm gonna have to spend a whole day just getting the house back in order so one release control go through the rest of the steps but what we have done because i noticed myself again just reacting to life reacting to getting things away we have picked two times a day where everybody cleans up together. 
And it doesn't always work Brady Bunch perfect. It sounds like this. This is the intention. After breakfast, they have their jobs to do. So Ross will vacuum the hallway and the dining room. Esme will vacuum the kitchen. And then they have little fights each morning about, I want to do this and I want to do that. And I'm like, this is the life. This is the life they're fighting over what they want to do. Not that they don't want to do it. it. Hasn't always been like that. We had to teach them, right? So they do the vacuuming in the morning. The compost goes out, the bins get taken out. So we start the day fresh. We start the day with a nice, mainly tidy house. And then throughout the day, instead of me being like the Nazi walking around like, you left this here, like I used to, it's not productive, it's not resourceful, you left this here. And then I'd walk out after lunch and I'd be moving stuff around and I'm the only one that does all this stuff and I'm putting shit away and no one else has seen and I'm getting annoyed with Gus and he's doing his best and kids are just present, drop their clothes where they are because that's what they do, Ross is coming up again. And um, yeah, so what we, what we decided to do was in the morning, we pack everything up, we start our day nice and fresh and... <laughs> he's walking off again um we start our day nice and fresh and then at night before they go to bed we do another whiz around and i just turn a blind eye to some of the bigger messes that they're enjoying coming in and out of through the day until i see they've lost interest with it and then i make the, i help them and direct them but we clean it up together i used to just go and do all of it and i was getting too overburdened i was getting too tired i was getting run down so now what i can do is just go ahead Okay, it's time and because it's a habit, they'll start doing it even before I ask. Is it done to my standard? Never, because it's she, he's eight and, and she's five. It's never done to the standard I want. Even when they vacuum the floors, here's the top tip. They vacuum the floors and I look at the floors and go, has the floor even been vacuumed? Like, that's a pretty rubbish job. Now, some parents will get in, make and do it perfect. But for me, at the ages that they're at now, it's about creating the habit. I don't really mind just yet how well the job's done because I watch them and they do it to the best of their ability. I don't want to put too much pressure or too much focus on having it done perfect. For now, at the developmental stage that they're at now, it is really just about getting it, getting the habit. And then as they get older, the expectation and the standard of the job that I expect will get better. If Esme was 15, would I accept that? Definitely not, but she's five. So it's developmental, you've got to look at the ages and not what we think is um, the standard, but what is the standard for a five-year-old and don't really get caught up. I used to do it, this is why I know and I work with so many of you and then the kids won't want to do it because they never feel like anything they do is good enough and that is not a good pattern to start running at such a young age because they've got the rest of the world out there telling them and showing them that they're not good enough for however, the rest of their life. Okay, so step number nine, we're getting close to the end now. Step number nine is you need to split your mind and your state. And I talked about this earlier. It's about when I get in work mode, I get very direct and masculine and focused. And if I am in that mindset, when the kids are around, it's like I'm just batting them off, get away from me, get away from me, get away from me. Here is a goal. This is what I'm moving towards and you're just in my way. <clears throat> get away. Don't get me wrong. I can still get like that and I recognize it. And it's such a restricted, constricted way to live. I feel frustrated. I feel angry when they come in here. I can feel that fire and I just want to go, get, get, get. And I might be getting stuff done, but it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel aligned. So it's about how can I soften it? And like I said at the beginning of the call, get my needs met while getting their needs met. Have them feeling certain within their own environment and supported while still being the adult and the parent and the boss and directing it. So I used to be more, it is my way because I'm the parent and you have to do what I say. Once again, it was really rigid and I noticed then they would push back to that. Whereas I offer this little bit more of a nurturing, creative, flowy space. It seems to flow a lot more. Now, I could be... <laughs> I touch wood when I'm saying all this because it's working pretty well now, but I could wake up tomorrow and it could all go down the tube and everybody's off doing their own thing and it's crazy and I'll be yelling and screaming and not coping. Um, so there's a disclaimer here that it doesn't always work, but now it's working most of the time because I'm so aware of it and I'm committed to it and I choose it. And I want the same for you as well because a lot of you are in the same predicament having to work from home for how, however long, we don't know. You got you know financial 
um, burdens happening, financial possibilities for you, like Gus just lost his job, our income, he had income one day, we created a lifestyle sustained by that income, wake up one morning and she's a goner. So what's to do? We need to make some changes and I'm here to support you through the changes as well. Um, yeah, step number 10 is change your expectation. Change your expectation of what is possible through the day and we have to be fluid and expressive and get creative around what we can do and how we can do it basically if you've got 50 things on your list so let's be more realistic say 10 things that you want to get accomplished through the day if you've got kids one two three four five and i guess it changes as, as many as you got in their ages for me with my kids now if i get three things done i've got to give myself a pat on the back if i get through the day sometimes give yourself a pat on the back so we've really got to open up our brains and our minds. We've got to open up our heart and our soul. A lot of us are parents on here. A lot of us are working from home. We have been gifted all these incredible, incredibly challenging challenges and struggles right now. So we can come out on the other side. We can teach our little people who are the future how to live with passion, how to lead with heart, how to create an environment that's harmonious within ourselves and in our home first. So we can go out there and share that with the rest of the world. And I feel like that's what we really need right now. So if you've enjoyed this and come along with the journey with us, you can join me on Facebook, Diane McKendrick, D-I-A-N-E, McKendrick, M-C-K-E-N-D-R-I-C-K. -E so Diane McKendrick on Facebook, add me as a friend. You can also follow me on Instagram where a lot of the stories are and you'll have a bit of a giggle of us and the family. It's a lot of fun. So Instagram, Diane McKendrick again. You can go to my website, www.dianemckendrick.com. Now, if you're wanting more of this information for a really, really, really good price, I have just released my mastermind. We're up to month module number two. Um, the first module is about finding out who you really are and getting deep down within you and pulling all that out. Uh, module number two is crisis management. We're talking about crisis management and soul purpose, soul desire. What the hell are you doing on the earth? What the hell are you on this rock for? I take you through all the process, the strategies, the questioning, the tools, the techniques that I personally use to create the seven, the seven bigger business, which is what I'm doing from home, moving fairly quickly towards that um, and master all areas of your life. I show you how I've been able to write a book with two little kids um, and a husband who's fly in, fly out. Four months it took me to get that out to people. So if you want to start living your dreams, if you want to have really solid purpose and elicit that and bring it out so you can wake up, like I said, and put your feet on the floor every single morning, the good and the not so good days, but still feel activated and energized and excited about what you get to do for the day and not just frustrated and reacting to your day and pulling your hair out like I was for so long, then you need to really seriously think about the mastermind. It is only $80 a month. You will get your own dashboard that you can access. It's timeless and spaceless. Two things, people, that people come to me and say, I can't afford it or I don't have time. So I have removed both of those challenges. It's only 80 bucks a month. And you can access it whatever time you want to because you've got your own dashboard there. So I don't want to hear those excuses because they're busted. Those myths are busted. The only other thing for you that's going to happen is you think you don't deserve it or you're not ready for it. So we remove these fears. We go a little bit deeper. There's always something, right? That's life. So we've removed that. If you don't think you deserve it, I'm here to tell you that you do. And it's not just about you. It is about the collective. It is about how can we help more people? How can I help you live in your higher purpose and self so you can get out there and help more people? That's what it's about. That's what it's about, guys. Wake up every single morning and ask, what can I give? What can I do differently today? How can I be creative? How can I infuse some laughter and joy into somebody else's life? And that's what I do it all for. So this is Diana Kendrick signing out from episode number two of the rise and shine podcast it's been beautiful and amazing to be here with you go over there to the website www.dianemckendrick join the facebook page jump on instagram and i'm really looking forward to going on this journey with you